Welcome to Lecture 5 of Financial Statement Analysis, Part B on Advanced DuPont Analysis. Advanced DuPont Analysis uses the reformatted financial statements, and when we've reformatted our financial statements and split all our business activities into operating and financing activities, DuPont Analysis then, using the reformatted financial statements, allows us to have operating ratios and financing ratios. And that means the effect of operating activities in the firm only influence our operating ratios and the financing activities of the firm only influence our financing ratios. It overcomes some of the problems that we just identified in the traditional DuPont analysis. Here is the advanced DuPont analysis formula. We start off again with return on equity and we say return on equity is equal to RNOA. This stands for return on net operating assets plus FLEV, financial leverage, times spread. We don't know what all these terms mean, so here are the different ratios broken down one by one. ROE is equal to NOPAT divided by sales. This is called our operating profit margin. Now, moving forward, whenever I talk about a business's profit margin, I'm going to assume that we're using the advanced DuPont analysis. So I'm not going to use operating profit margin, I'm just going to say profit margin, meaning NOPAT over sales. So we're taking our operating profit this time divided by sales. So any effect on interest expenses are not measured in our operating profits. So one of the first problems with the traditional DuPont analysis we identified was if we borrow money and we pay interest, the interest expense lowers our profit margin. This fixes it. Using operating profit, interest expense doesn't change our operating profit. So our profit margin will only change based on operating activities. Next up, we've got the asset turnover ratio, again, focusing on operating assets. So the asset turnover ratio is sales divided by average net operating assets. So only if our net operating assets change will our asset turnover ratio change. Using the cafe example I mentioned before, if we pay our employees their wages, the liabilities decrease and our assets decrease, that will not change our net operating assets. As one asset decreases by the $25,000 wage bill, the liability decreased by $25,000 as well. So our net assets stay the same. Our net operating assets stay the same. Operating sales, operating asset turnover. Again, I'm just going to call it asset turnover moving forward. We're going to assume the advanced DuPont analysis is being used. We combine the profit margin and the asset turnover ratio together. These are both ratios capturing the operating activities of the firm. When we multiply the profit margin by the asset turnover ratio, we get the return on net operating assets, RNOA. Sometimes you'll also see this ratio referred to as OROA, operating return on assets. They both mean the same thing. So whether I use RNOA or OROA, they both mean the profit margin times the asset turnover. It's a measure of our return on operating assets. Okay, very similar to the return on assets formula we used before, but focusing only on those operating assets. The financing side of the business is captured by the amount of money we borrow and the interest rate we pay on our borrowings. So here we start with financial leverage. Financial leverage is often shortened to FLEV, and it's equal to the average net financial obligations divided by our average owner's equity. So essentially, the amount we have borrowed our financing liabilities divided by our owner's equity. Then finally, we needed to take into account the interest rate we paid because we showed that that affected the traditional DuPont analysis. The interest rate we pay on our debt, we call net borrowing cost. So we have this term called spread. Spread is equal to return on net operating assets. Remember, RNOA, we captured up here, profit margin times asset turnover. No pad over sales is profit margin. Sales over average NOA is asset turnover. So this first part of spread is the return we're getting on our operating assets. Then we minus off the net borrowing cost, which simply is the interest uh, expense, the interest rate that we're paying. Net borrowing cost is our net financial expense after tax, the amount of interest we've paid, divided by our average NFO, the amount of debt we've borrowed. So the interest we've paid divided by the amount we've borrowed gives us an interest rate on what we're paying back out. So spread is the return on net operating assets minus the net borrowing cost. 
If I'm investing my money into profitable assets that are generating an 8% return on net operating assets, and I'm borrowing money from the bank at 3% interest rates, I'm generating a 5% positive spread. This means that all the debt I'm using is increasing my return on S my return on equity as I've got a positive spread. However, if I borrow money from the bank at 3% net borrowing cost, and I invest it into assets that are not very productive, and they only return a 2% return on net operating assets, that means for every dollar I borrow, I'm going to actually be levering up my losses. So if we have a negative spread, the return on your assets is less than your borrowing cost, that's going to actually magnify the losses and decrease your return on equity very rapidly. So we have return on equity. It is broken up into the operating part of the business, profit margin and asset turnover, and the financing part of the business, how much we've borrowed and the interest rate we're paying. And if we're generating returns higher than the interest we have to pay on our debt. And we've got all these different formulas. As I said previously, they're heavily reliant on those reformatted financial statements. And it does prevent some of the problems with the traditional DuPont analysis that crop up. It does allow us to get a better understanding of the firm's actual ability to generate returns. This figure here tries to break down our advanced DuPont analysis into the various subcomponents of all the ratios. And it's actually kind of like a ratio family tree. The family tree here shows how all the different ratios build up together to show us the firm's overall return on equity. Starting up here, return on equity equals net income over average equity. Then we broke it down into return on net operating assets plus financial leverage times spread. On this side of the family tree, we have our operating ratios. And on this side of the, of the family tree, we have our financing ratios. For example, our operating ratios, return on net operating assets, can be broken down into profit margin and asset turnover. The profit margin ratios can also be broken down into subcomponents. We can look at every single expense the business has and see how that affects the profit margin. Our asset turnover ratio can be broken down into every single asset item and how that turnover affects the business's profitability. On the other side over here on the financing side of the family tree, we can look at what impacts our borrowing costs. Okay, Any of the individual components that affect our borrowing costs along the way. Different loans that we have as well could be analyzed separately. This family tree provides some powerful analysis for us because it allows us to see how the returns that a business generate can then be distributed to different people and different stakeholder groups are interested in different returns. So for example, when we talk about the shareholders, the shareholders of a business are really interested in the return on equity. They only get a stake in the equity side of the business, so they're interested in the return on equity. However, overall, the firm is interested in its return on operating assets because all of the assets the firm uses influences the value of the total firm. And then finally, debt holders, whether your firm becomes really successful and earns lots of profit, debt holders don't get to earn the upside. They only get to get paid their interest rate. So they generate the net borrowing cost or the interest rate. That's the realized return that they receive. Each of these groups, when we're valuing the company based on a shareholder's perspective or the value of the total firm or valuing the debt a business has, they each have their own cost of capital that we have to use. And we'll learn more about that in a future week on cost of capital. So when we looked at the DuPont family tree, we saw that profit margin could be broken down into various components. But first of all, let's just make sure we understand what the profit margin ratio means. Profit margin assesses the profitability of the operating assets that you're actually selling. So net operating profit after tax divided by sales for every dollar you sell, how much are you keeping as an operating profit? So ignoring the financing costs, how much of the sales are you actually keeping as an operating profit? The profitability of each dollar of sales. You can then break that down into all the subcomponents. For example, you could identify all the material expenses a business has to see how each expense or each line item on your income statement is affecting your overall profit margin. Now, the simple ones that people should always try and look at is your gross profit margin. Okay, so you take the gross profit, gross operating profit, again, this time we're using our reformatted statements, the gross operating profit, and you divide through by sales. Then you can look at the different selling and admin costs along the way and see how they affect the profit margin. This is what it looks like for Qantas. Qantas run an airline, so obviously their staffing costs are really large. 
you have to pay your pilots a lot of money. There's always the stewardesses on the flights, all the air hosts. About 25% in 2005 and down to about 24% of their total revenue goes to their staff. And another big one, fuel costs. Up to 26% of their revenue goes on fuel in 2012. And the actual cost of the aircraft makes up about 19% of their cost base. And the other things are really quite minor. So there's three broad things that influence Qantas's uh, profit margin, which is their cost of staff, the cost of fuel, and the cost of the actual operation of the aeroplanes as well. So this allows you to then think about what are the trends in these accounts? How are these items going to influence the profit margin of the business moving forward? It helps with our forecasting when we break these ratios down onto the line by line items. The asset turnover ratio was our sales divided by average net operating asset. It tells us how effectively we're turning over our assets and using our asset base to generate sales for the business. So asset turnover ratios are really important in telling us, are we using our assets effectively? And again, we can break the asset turnover ratio down into various components. We often look at working capital management and long-term long -term asset management. The key ratios we look at, we always calculate the asset turnover ratio as it is. We then break it down into some of the key components, our operating working capital to sales. Do we have too much inventory that we're not selling? Are our accounts receivable just sitting around and not being turned into cash? The operating working capital to sales will tell us about this. Look at the accounts receivable turnover. Are we able to generate cash from our accounts receivable? And then if we divide that ratio by 365 divided by the ratio, we get the days receivable. Similar for inventory and accounts payable turnover. They start telling us about how we're utilizing and how efficient we are with our individual accounts through time. When you do the asset turnover ratio, sales divided by average NOA, as you break it down on an individual asset item, for example, sales divided by inventory, that's fine to do. But if you flip it around, do one over the asset turnover or one over uh, inventory over sales that way, it's a little bit easier to understand what's actually happening with it there. So that's that's the suggestion to uh, inverse the ratio because it's a little bit easier to actually analyze then. So looking at Qantas, broken down some of their different accounts, their sales over net operating assets, that's the overall asset turnover ratio, up to 1.2 by 2012. So their whole asset base, they're generating about 20% more than that in sales each year. Then we can have a look at if their operating assets, their property plant and equipment, and all the different levels, break it down into accounts receivable, payables, all those levels. We then come to the financing effects of the business. So the financing effects are influenced by how much debt we have and the interest rate we pay on the debt. So we know that the amount we borrow and the interest rate influence our business's return on equity. However, as you borrow more, your risk increases as well. So as we borrow more, we saw examples before it led to an increase in our return on equity, but it also does increase the business's risk. So understanding the financing effects of the business are really important to understand how it influences our return on equity, but we also have to consider how it influences our business's risk. So financial leverage, that was our sort of debt to equity, how have we financed the business, and spread was how we're generating returns from our assets minus the interest rate we have to pay. There's a positive correlation between your financial leverage and your interest rate. Because borrowing more increases your business's risk, as you borrow more, the interest rate you have to pay will go up. So the positive correlation is, as your risk increases, your interest rates will also increase. As your financial leverage goes up, your net borrowing cost goes up. So when you're thinking about analyzing your financial leverage, you need to consider how does financial leverage affect return on equity? Is it a positive effect? What is your cost of debt? What is the interest rate you have to pay on your debt? And is the amount of debt the business have appropriate for the amount of risk the managers are willing to take on? So if debt does increase the business's risk, why do businesses still use so much debt? Well, debt is usually a cheaper source of funding than equity. That's because debt requires fixed repayments, a fixed interest rate kind of situation. There's predefined payments, so that lowers the risk from the creditor's point of view. Interest is tax deductible, so it can be cheaper for the owners of the business to use interest, which is tax deductible relative to equity and dividend payments are not tax deductible. Extra discipline on management means that 
When there are creditors involved in the business, they may impose things like debt covenants, and it means managers have to work really hard to keep the bankers and lenders happy so that they're maintaining the performance of the business and keeping their ability to repay the um, interest repayments back. It's also easier to communicate with a bank than it is to a broad share market. You can send private information to your bank in negotiating a, a loan, whereas with the broad share market, you may be unwilling to provide the, everyone in the market with private information about your business because then competitors can see it. So it's easy to communicate quickly and privately with a bank who's going to give you debt compared to sometimes issuing shares. How much debt is appropriate for your business is really difficult to answer. Different industries generally operate with different debt levels. Financial companies like banks and utility companies will often have the highest levels of financial leverage. That's because they have predictable and safe cash flow. Then when we look at riskier companies like mining companies, especially early stage mining companies, they're going to have a lot less debt because they have such high levels of operating risk. So how much risk your business has will heavily be reliant, will be reliant on the operating risk of the firm. What sort of fixed cost base compared to variable costs do you have? How cyclical is the industry you're operating in? All those factors you need to consider when trying to figure out if it's an appropriate level of debt that your business has. There's a lot of nuance to this. There's no perfect answer. It's going to be requiring your analysis of what you think will be likely to happen in the future and if the business will be able to safely make the so overall, in looking at advanced DuPont analysis, we've discussed operating activities of the business, the profit margin times asset turnover, and we've discussed the financing activities of the business, how much we've borrowed and how the interest rate affects the borrowings. These all tie in to influence our return on equity, but now our operating activities and our financing activities are separated and our ratios are going to be able to give us much more of an understanding of what's actually driving the value of the business. However, there are other ratios that are really useful to analyze when looking at a business. We need to think about the business's liquidity, solvency, and some of the financial ratios to think if the business is likely to be a good investment. So we'll go through those next.